A very warm welcome, everyone, to this event organized by We Empower Asia um, in partnership with the European Union and UN Women. We are delighted to have so many um, guests today. We're going to be waiting one more minute to give people a chance to join in. We have um, a good number of turnout already. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you join us from. A happy, happy International Women's Day. I'm going to get started um, while we wait for people to join in, but it's really great to see actually I'm just looking through the, the list of participants and it's great to see so many um, familiar faces also members and friends of the we Empower Asia um, family, but also friends from UN Women from the European Union, a lot of our partners um, and collaborators um, are on the line, but also a couple of new faces, a lot of the companies that we have been working with over the past. I think it's great to have us all together back here. Um, I remember last year at International Women's Day, the situation was a, a very different one. It was very much, we started to hit the pandemic and we even came to its peak. So a lot of the International Women's Day celebrations turned into either digital ones or in many countries didn't, um, we didn't celebrate at all. So even more excited um, we are that um, we have a lot of um, events that are taking place place in hybrid events um, today, but we are also really happy to have this event um, today. And I know we had uh, a lot of meetings, digital meetings over the past year working restlessly on um, the pandemic and particularly on combating many of the overproportional impacts that women face during the pandemic. And I really want to use this uh, momentum today not to think about and not to really discuss the issues, but really celebrate and acknowledge and really um, put yourself a clap on the shoulder because, uh, shoulder because there's so many in this room that have actually really restlessly have worked over the past months to really structure and really structure the response and the recovery of this impactful pandemic in a more gender responsive way. And it really goes very well um, with this year's International Women's Day topic, which is when women lead. And I would ask you also participants, please um, use the hashtag when women lead um, throughout the session, um, share what you have um, heard. The event will be also live face stream, um, streamed on Facebook. So there will be um, a lot of communication about this. So please contribute to the communication. So it's not a private event. So please um, consider this when um, speaking and when having the conversations. Before we go into um, really a very exciting panel we're going to have today, um, we would like, like just to, to open up a little bit for the audience and understand who's actually with us um, in the room. I see already some of you in the chat um, from the different countries, but we have um, prepared a, a poll where we want to know who is in the room. So just that you know that this is going to be coming up in a second. But before we are doing this, I just want to bring us all into the spirit of International Women's Day of celebration. And we have produced a little video which really shows and gives a little bit the idea of what we want to do today. We want to look into what happens when women lead. And with this, I hope our technology works. Here we go. As business itself is changing, so should the definition of leadership. It's important that women feel that their gender isn't a factor at all in a workspace. Because what is a man's job and what is a woman's job? You can have the same duties. I choose to be a landscape architect and being a landscape architect, I want to use my ability to tackle climate change. I feel that it's a sense of being a leader and a sense of emergency that I have to do it now. I come from a, an industry where there's a lot of emphasis on women's role that comes with a lot of stereotypes. It's really the mindsets that need to be broken. People told me that you're too imaginative. Does she have the experience to be able to steward an agency? And yeah, you need to prove constantly you are capable of being a good photographer. It's not been easy. Uh, it's certainly been a challenge, but I think with challenge comes opportunity. As a woman in business, we can offer um, different 
perspective on the table. We make it absolutely part of the new normal that it is normal for a woman to be CEO. It is normal for the woman to be chosen. We can start to change the narrative. If the more women um, decision makers uh, we see, that's something really exciting for women leaders. When a woman leads, she's an inspiration. You know, I've got more to me. I can make an impact. When women lead, we all rise together. Great. I hope that put us all off on a, a really nice and um, interactive and very informal session today. Um, but we want to know with who we're going to be talking and who's going to be listening, at least um, in this Zoom link. We know we have many, many more on the Facebook live stream. But in the room today, let's just do a, a quick poll. And I think by now we are all very familiar with um, using all of this. So if you would please go to your slido.com website, slido.com. And there you just need to input hashtag UN Women. So slido.com, hashtag UN Women. And we're going to start off um, with the first um, questions and understand to really see who is in the room. So first, we are quite interested because that is a regional global event. And nowadays, we don't know anymore who is going to be joining us as we are very broadly inviting people. So just having a, a first check, are you? joining us from somewhere in Asia, Europe, Americas, Africa. Well, looks we have a very um, good audience, a lot of um, Asian representatives, as we have expected. Also some other geographies um, just coming in, a lot of Southeast Asia. We had some South Asian events today as well um, with our country offices in India. So I think some of them might join here as well. So we, I think we can move further to the ne next question, but looks a very Asian Pacific sort of audience. A lot of people joining us from the business world. And this is also the intent today to have a conversation with business leaders and particularly take a focus on what does it take for a woman in business to lead. And I'm going to share a little bit why this is our focus today. But obviously that we will hear today, it's not only businesses, but we need to have support from others. So I'm glad to see other sectors there as well. And we just want to look at a, a more open question on what is the biggest barrier that must be overcome for women to reach leadership positions in business. Remember our theme today, when women lead, hashtag when women lead. So let's see what the barriers are that we're gonna be also discussing um, later with the panel. Gender bias, um, a very big one. And I think something we all recognize um, across the geographies, stereotype, mindset, really interesting that that comes forward so much as we have heard this in many countries um, through our work. And with this, I would also um, just turn further and share a little bit about the work that UN Women and um, the European Union are for the moment doing together. And many of you I know are very deeply involved in this, particularly the panel that we're going to have today. But our joint program, We Empower Asia, is a program um, together with the EU, and it's really seeking to increase the number of women in business um, who lead and participate equally in the, in the economy. And we're doing this program in seven countries, as you see on the slide here, and a very particular focus on the program. And I'm sure we're gonna be hearing a bit more, and you will see also when we speak about uh, the panelists or with the panelists, is really to ensure really bringing a gender lens to the business world in um, Asia and the Pacific, but particularly also across the lines, the export and import lines, the trade lines between Europe and, um, and Asia. And we have also some European um, delegates today that are gonna be speaking um, to us. Maybe one, one focus point of the program 
it's not all, but what, one thing we're going to be discussing today, and that's why there are so many business representatives today, is the element of this program on how to work together with the private sector. What does it take in, in business um, to really embrace a gender lens? And we're working through um, a framework which many of you, I'm sure, have heard about is the Women's Empowerment Principles. And I'm not talking too much about them because we're going to hear them into action um, a little bit later. But before I hand it over to our um, next speaker, I just wanted to share um, a very personal story, um, which I experienced this weekend. My eight-year-old daughter asked me um, at her bedtime story, Mama, do you know who Clara Zetkin was? And I said, well, I know Clara Zetkin was a, a German woman. And she said, you know what, mom? She invented International Women's Day because I told her obviously a lot about my work. And then I said, oh, really? And I started reading up a little bit more about it. And I just was emotionally very um, touched and shared this with the team. I said, isn't that really a great story? It's sort of the first um, International Women's Day was celebrated 110 years ago in Europe, um, namely in um, Austria, Denmark, Germany, and Switzerland. And I just thought it's a really nice story that in, in twofold, it's Firstly, fitting very well, and um, I'll introduce Mr. Bosini in a second, who is from the EU, and I just sort of it demonstrates sort of the linkages again. And the second thing I thought, isn't it really nice that young girls start thinking about this and really are aware of um, International Women's Day at such an early age um, and, and really reflect on it. And with this and the transition into um, our really joint program on We Empower Asia, I would love to introduce um, Mr. Giuseppe Busini, who is the deputy head of the European delegation to Thailand, to just share a couple of reflections from the EU and why the EU is um, investing and is celebrating with us International Women's Day. Over to you, um, Giuseppe. Thank you very much, uh, Katia. And uh, uh, before we go any further into this introduction, I would like to wish a happy Women's Day to all the participants today. Um, and I would also like to thank a lot the UN Women We Empower Asia project team for organizing this uh, interesting event, which uh, gives us yet one more opportunity to celebrate uh, uh, the International Women's Day. Uh, now, I mean, I of course, I would have liked to, to be there, uh, surrounded by people in a kind of physical audience, but we know that we are in this sort of new normal due to the pandemics. So uh, let's be happy with this. Let's welcome participants from around the world. There's an opportunity in everything. Um, but this pandemic gives me uh, the, the opportunity of, of making a couple of uh, initial uh, considerations. First of all, uh, we have all gone through a, a difficult period. It has been almost one year now. Uh, we have had lockdowns, we have had uh, restrictions, we have had difficult situations, and we all know that uh, very often women have paid a very hefty price for, for this situation. There, have been, there are situations of violence, situations of, uh, uh, didn't, let's say, discomfort, and, uh, 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 which have been very difficult for, for women. And my second uh, uh, pandemic-related consideration is that uh, uh, the new normal has been mentioned, including in the video, and this new normal must give us the opportunity of reinventing many things, uh, including gender-related issues and uh, uh, giving women new opportunities to, uh, uh, to do better on the workplace, uh, in the society, and uh, achieving a more gender-balanced society. Uh, now, uh, why do you uh, uh, pay so much attention to these issues? Uh, uh, women's empowerment and gender equality are really core European values. Uh, the first measures were introduced already in 1957 with the founding treaty of the European Union, the Treaty of Rome. Uh, in 1957, we already enshrined in that treaty the principle of equal pay, for instance. So this is one of the core values, one of the things that we really want to fight for. And uh, uh, I must say that we have achieved some, some positive results in uh, legislation, in gender mainstreaming, and specific measures for the advancement of women. <clears throat> I would like to, uh, kind of drawing on my personal experience, uh, when I joined the uh, uh, European Commission, 
many years ago. Uh, I will not say the, the, the precise number of, uh, of, uh, of years, but it was kind of a couple of decades ago. I remember that uh, women in management positions were still very few. Now we have a, a situation which has improved a lot. Um, we have right now, uh, or uh, no, I should say a couple of years ago, we had 41% of all management positions in the European Commission, the executive branch of the European Union, were held by, by, by women. Uh, so there have been some, some impressive progresses uh, on this. Uh, I should also mention that the current president of the European Commission is, is a woman, Ms. Ursula von der Leyen, and we have 13 female commissioners out of 27. So it's almost uh, uh, 50 percent. And in any case, we keep striving for uh, uh, equality and uh, a gender balanced uh, uh, approach in the uh, appointments uh, to middle management, uh, higher management positions in the European Union. The goal is a union where uh, women and men are free to pursue their chosen path of life, have equal opportunities to thrive, and can equally participate and lead our society. Uh, for this, of course, we must all fight for ending gender-based violence, challenge gender stereotypes, but also close the pay and pension gaps, the gender care gap, and gender gaps in the labor market. Uh, we, as uh, European Union, we keep legislating in this uh, sector. Um, just a few days ago, on the 4th of March, the European Commission presented a, a legislative proposal on binding pay transparency measures to ensure that women and men receive equal pay for equal work. This is a political priority for our president, and is especially, as I said, is especially relevant in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic and our wish to build back better. Um, but this is not all. I mean, we can do only so much as legislator. We uh, can uh, advance the political and legislative agenda, but we need really everybody's uh, uh, support and action to make sure that uh, we really go towards uh, a world where uh, genders uh, enjoy equal rights and equal treatment. Uh, so this also concerns a lot the private sector, and I'm very happy to be here today with uh, several representatives of the, the private sector, business and companies from all around the world. Uh, this is something that uh, also businesses and, uh, and companies must do, implement, support women actively, uh, implement the workplace policies uh, uh, and so on. Uh, there are no excuses uh, any longer. We have also, for instance, a very good and um, uh, effective uh, toolbox, the women's empowerment principles that will be, uh, I hope will be discussed uh, much further in uh, today's session. Uh, and so companies, uh, must also uh, lead the way and uh, provide examples for how business can help overcome these, uh, these issues. I would just like to mention something um, just to, uh, to, to confirm how important the role of businesses is. Uh, I read yesterday that uh, uh, um, a Dutch minister uh, highlighted in, uh, in her speech uh, to celebrate Women's Day yesterday, highlighted that uh, if you take the 100 uh, uh, top Dutch companies, there are more uh, CEOs named Peter than female CEOs. This might sound a bit funny. I mean, it made me smile at the beginning, but it's also at the same time a very sad recognition on how uh, work must still be done uh, in order to achieve uh, at least, I mean, as a, as a uh, tendency, uh, gender equality. So uh, we must do this because it's fair, because it's, uh, it's the right thing to do, but also because it makes sense from uh, uh, an economic point of view. It has been estimated for the Asia Pacific region alone that by advancing women's equality, the region could add 
4.5 trillion US dollars to the collective GDP in 2025, which is to say uh, a 12 percent increase over business as usual. So this is uh, to just to stress that it really it does make perfect sense also from an economic point of view. So um, just to conclude this, this brief introductory remarks, uh, this is also the reason why the European Union, apart from its uh, kind of political and policy push, is also keen to support uh, activities and projects like uh, We Empower Asia. Uh, we want to uh, support uh, the tackling of this complex challenge from all angles. This project and partnership between the EU and the UN Women opens opportunities for companies and enterprises to advance gender equality and sustainable development in a meaningful way. So we encourage all uh, companies and businesses here today to learn from the examples and best practices to figure out what works and what works maybe a bit less. But it's also true that sometimes you, you learn even more from somebody else's mistakes and pitfalls. So uh, how are you changing attitude and stereotypes in your workplace to make women more visible and encourage women to be part of the decision making? Uh, things, issues like that. And I look forward to hearing about uh, you, your experience about how these pro progressive work policies and uh, uh, what kind of creative solutions uh, the private sector uh, is able to give to all these challenges. So once again, um, to conclude, happy Women's Day to everybody. And uh, I look forward to a, a very fruitful and creative exchange uh, in the, the course of this session. Thank you very much. Back to you, Katya. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Puccini. Um, I would love to kind of move us on and... Um, oops, there's a bit of an echo. Should be better. Okay, I'm really um, thrilled um, to move us on and I'm really actually very hearted that we have Ms. Bili Yi um, with us today. She is the Southeast Asia correspondent from the Thomas Reuters Foundation. For the ones that do not know this, but this is a charitable arm of uh, Thomas Reuters, and she has been over the past year since 2002 reporting in Asia, particularly around human rights, um, but also including um, areas like gender inequality, migration and refugees in the in the region. So very interesting background um, that she brings to this panel and I think uh, will really stimulate a, a great conversation. And she has also a very strong um, country focus or has been working in uh, Malaysia um, with Malay. Malaysia Yakini, sorry, for the, the first news portal in, uh, in, in, in Malaysia. And was before that um, this news agency AFP. So a very, very broad um, experience. And we are really thrilled to have you with us, Lee. And uh, we are looking forward for a very enlightening and interesting conversation with an equally interesting panel um, today. So over to you, Lee. Um, thank you very much for moderating this um, for us. Thank you, Katia, and um, good afternoon, everyone from Kuala Lumpur. Um, my name is Bailey Yi. I am the South Asia correspondent with the Council of the South. Um, we are celebrating the International Women's Day in such a unique situation this year, where many of us have been working from home for the past one year due to COVID-19. So, if you are like me, with a very active four-year-old boy, you know how challenging it has been to juggle work and childcare responsibility, especially for women. We have also come to learn how important it is for companies to be supportive of women and working parents, especially at this time, to, to keep the economy going. And like Mr. Giuseppe said in his opening remarks just now, it makes every business sense to promote gender equality at work. So at the Thomson Reuters Foundation, we really focus on human rights stories and gender equality is a key focus of our coverage. Um, as a journalist who have been reported in Asia for the, almost 20 years, in the past year, you know, I have reported on how the pandemic has disproportionately affected women's career, how women are more likely to be impacted by this pandemic, and how women are picking up a heavier load of unpaid childcare and chores than men's. But 
even before the pandemic and these setbacks, we know the percentage of women in leadership globally has is still very low and because it's had yet to surpass 40%. And there have been improvement, but the progress is so slow. Like looking more specifically at where we are today, um, Asia Pacific is still lagging behind other regions in terms of women's representation in leadership positions. Asia is also the only continent where female labor force participation has been regressing. So this might all sound like a pretty grim scenario, but it actually presents us with the opportunity to take action now to ensure that the gains for gender equality are not lost. The private sector, like Mr. Giuseppe said just now as well, especially has a major role to play in ensuring a gender inclusive recovery or build back better. Um, this is why I'm so looking forward to the discussion today, um, bringing together the business community to share their own perspective and practices on how they create and how they can create an environment to promote women in leadership. Um, we have a fantastic um, panel of speakers from five different countries, Malaysia, the Philippines, India, Vietnam, and China, who will each bring a unique perspective on what they have done in this area. Um, I will introduce each of them later, and I very much look forward to hearing their experiences. Um, we will also have about half an hour of Q&A sessions, so please um, put your questions in the chat room and we will open up the floor after each of the speakers share with us their experiences. So now, um, I would like to call upon our first speaker, my fellow Malaysian, Ms. Anne Abraham, um, the founder and chairperson of Lead Women in Malaysia. Um, Anne was a corporate leader from the technology industry for more than 20 years before she founded Lead Women, a consultancy company in 2011. She's also the co-founder of the Malaysian chapter of the 30% Club, a global business campaign lobbying for increased women's representation on the boards. Anne is also a board director of two Malaysian public listed companies and a strong advocate for gender balance leadership. So, Anne, could you tell us about Lead Women and how your work is instrumental in creating this nationwide change? Thank you very much, Lee. Thank you for the introduction. Glad to be on this panel. <clears throat> so, Lead Women, yeah, I founded Lead Women in late 2011. And that was at the same time when the Malaysian government was very focused on a aspirational target of 30% for women in leadership and on the boards of corporate Malaysia. So that was a start for the journey for Malaysia really at that point in time. And so when we started this organization coming off the corporate world and having been a woman leader myself in a, in a very male dominated industry, the tech industry, I felt I could lend myself quite nicely into this space because I in a way faced many of the challenges, the biases, the stereotypes we still spoke about and I could see how that, in a way, had impacted my ability in, in many ways to bring the best of my leadership forward. So in setting up uh, uh, Lead Women now today in our 10th year, our whole focus was about how do we increase women in leadership and increase women on the boards of corporate Malaysia. So probably the only organization at that time that really looked at um, gender issues for corporate women. You know, a lot of the work around women were focused on the social areas, but this was really the first step to look at what does it take to, in a way, bring more equity into the workspaces and the boardrooms so that, you know, women would have an opportunity to enter and deliver their very best in leadership. So in the process of that work that I started in 2011, we worked very closely with the government of Malaysia to really look at building the supply of these qualified women for the boards. And the reason we started with the supply is because when we went out to boards and asked, why are there not enough women? Or why aren't there women on your boards? The answer was, where are they? So really we were very insignificant in the market. There were, there were you know, it was like women don't sit on boards, you know, and that's really a male playing field. So we thought, why don't we start to really go out there and build a repository of really qualified women? Because I know coming from that space, there were so many. So we did just that, we built it, and then we went out to the boards and said, look, we have women, you know, and why don't we look at positioning some of them? But the demand never happened and it didn't take off. So we had the supply, but the demand, though there were opportunities, these women were not being taken onto boards. And then we realized we needed to shift our conversation from a women's issue 
to a business issue. Um, and the only way we could shift it was because we were so entrenched working with the women's ministry, we were seen as a women's organization working on women's issues. So to shift it to a business issue, I then went out and co-founded the 30% um, Club chapter, which was a very successful uh, lo lobby campaign in the UK. Met up with a the founder there and understood what they, they stood for and how they drove their campaign. We brought this campaign back. And uh, we were able to then engage with the stakeholders that mattered. And they were the regulators, they were the government, they were the uh, chairs and directors of boards with the Securities Commission. And based on those partnerships, we were able to take the conversation into the business world. And jointly, you know, working on the women's issue and also having a good perspective and entrenched in the business world, we could see the needle shift. And so when we started our journey, of the 900 listed companies in Malaysia, there was only about 7% of women. Today, on the 900 listed companies, we have about 17.7%. Not great, but on the top 100 companies, we have almost 26%. So really, we feel that it is important to keep that conversation at a very strategic level and to ensure that it is embedded as a strategic business imperative and not as a CSR initiative. Um, and so that has been our journey. And we continue that journey now moving down into the organizations to ensure that whatever we do at the board level is sustainable. So we are working on DEI in the workplaces to ensure inclusion and retention of women at the C levels so that they become pipeline for the boards. So that's really, uh, you know, in a nutshell, what Lead Women does. And we're very much focused in that space. Happy to be the um, UN Women Partner for the WEPS program because it really aligns so well to the work we do. It's a truly initi uh, strategic initiative for us. And um, a lot of the resources and tools that we're seeing from the WEPS program is so applicable in the corporate world. And we think that this is really one way that we could build that sustainable change uh, in DEI across the organizations. Thank you so much, Anne, for sharing that very exciting insight into how your work is really interesting and bring the net nationwide change. Um, but to now, we want to turn into looking actually how that could work in the company and how company works to increase the number of female leaders within your company. We will hear from Ms. Um, Jonah Diluman Punier. Um, Jonah has been with Coca-Cola for nine years. She took on the roles of the Philippines franchise operations director in 2021. And prior to that, she was the public affairs, communication and sustainability director in the company. Um, she has spearheaded programs that focuses on areas that include women empowerment. Um, Jonah, we know Coca-Cola Philippines has undertaken a broad range of activities across the value chain to ensure there's gender inclusive business practices. Can you tell us a bit more about what Coca-Cola is doing to support women to get into their leadership role? Thanks, Lee, and an empowered Women's Day to us all. Uh, I'm very honored to be part of this panel to share how Coca-Cola builds its pipeline for women leaders. At Coca-Cola, we believe women play an important role in every function and in every level, which is why we have a 50-50 gender parity goal across all levels of management. And as Anne mentioned, getting to the school doesn't happen overnight, which is why it is key to develop the talent pipeline early and consistently. Women need to fairly flow towards career progression from recruiting to hiring to retaining and to promoting. And we believe this can happen if we remove two things. First is we need to remove the bias. And there were a lot of comments earlier in the poll. The second one is we need to remove the barriers. Let's start with removing the bias. As you all know, unconscious gender bias is the invisible and unnoticed barrier for women to grow and lead in organizations. You know, women are called bossy, but men are called decisive. Women are called aggressive, but men are called assertive. And women are called emotional, but men are called passionate. With this, we needed to remove the unconscious bias in every part of the process. Take, for example, on hiring. At Coca-Cola, it is mandatory to have a diverse pool of interviewees as well as interviewers. This means every interview panel needs to have a female 
and the short list of candidates must always include female talent. The diversity of the panel and the candidates help support an unbiased interview process. And as Mr. Mr. Bussini said, the voice of the female is heard through the process. Now, the other career phase where we lose women is during promotions. The bias that often happens here is about readiness. More often than not, men are promoted because of potential, while women are promoted based on performance. And it doesn't help that the women themselves never feel ready enough. You know, have I checked all qualifications? Can I really do this job? Maybe it's not the right time. And this is where the importance of mentorship and sponsorship come in. We need leaders, both men and women, to help women navigate their career progression and give them a push when they have self-doubts to take the next step. At Coca-Cola, we have a global women's leadership council that play a strong activist role in growing our pipeline of female talent. The council has a sponsorship program to increase the pace of women's exposure and access to opportunities to move the leadership landscape towards 50-50 diversity. I can personally share that I have over 10 mentors inside and outside the company who have pushed me out of my comfort zone and has helped me progress faster in my career. Now, from removing the bias, we move to removing the barriers. We need to, we needed to understand where the female talent pipeline was leaking. At Coca-Cola, we realized that we were losing women leaders during early parenthood. And also in the poll earlier, maternity support was raised. You know, a lot of women would take a break and park their career for a while when they have a baby. We respect every person's decision, but we also wanted to adapt our policies accordingly. One example is our soft landing policy for new mothers, where when they return to work only with four hours and gradually increase an hour for every month the child grows. This means they only go full-time eight hours when their child is eight months which is a big deal for countries like the Philippines that only have a little over three months maternity leave. And I was personally able to use this policy twice, and it was so helpful physically, but more importantly, emotionally. The common challenge for working moms is the gift both ways. Am I working enough? Am I spending enough time with the kids? Now, this policy helped me erase the guilt whenever I'd leave the office early or whenever I'd send an email while the baby was asleep. With programs like this, I became more open to considering career moves and even promotions amidst life stage changes. In summary, building a strong pipeline towards 50-50 gender parity meant we had to remove biases and remove barriers so that women can break through in their career. We created policies that removed unconscious gender bias in every step of the process, and we created programs that remove the psychological barriers that limit women's career progression. But the most important part to all of these was the culture, how we build an enabling environment for women and for any person for that matter to succeed. At Coca-Cola, diversity and inclusion is not just an HR policy, nor is it just a sustainability pillar. It is embedded in every level, in every function, in every process, and in every person. And with all these efforts, we were honored to win last year's WEPS Awards for Gender Inclusive Workplace, especially since Coca-Cola Philippines has 57% women in leadership roles. So with that, thank you for having me today. And I hope this inspires more companies and organizations to fill the pipeline and drive more women into leadership positions. Go ahead, break those biases and break those barriers so that every woman can break through. So thank you, UN Women and We Empower Asia for this opportunity. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Jonah. Thank you so much. Um, I really like your point about, you know, it's both about remo removing the bias and also removing the barriers. And you also touch on the sort of culture barriers that we have in Asia here. Um, you know, where women is really sometimes it's, a, it's an issue for women um, in Asia, where we grew up in the sort of tradition of family. Um, I might come back to you later on that and uh, to elaborate on that. Um, but next, you know, um, I am very excited to hear from the next speaker because it's a him. Um, because to achieve uh, gender equality, we know we need both men and women in this together. Uh, it's not, you know, women cannot be, you know, just in the fight alone. Um, 
So I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Ravi Banagar, um, who is the Director of External Affairs and Partnerships uh, at Record Bank Kizer in India. Um, Record Bank Kizer has been a leader in addressing the issue of gender pay gap. Um, in Asia Pacific, um, women on average make about 15% less than men. Um, so while we are seeing more companies that start to report on gender pay gaps, um, we are very, um, you know, we want to hear from Ravi on, you know, why uh, Racket Bank is the first company to release a global gender pay gap report covering all of their offices. So Ravi, can you tell us why the company find it important to undertake the study at a global level? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, you know, uh, uh, first of all, wishing uh, all, of, all, all of us on the, you know, uh, International Women's Day. It's been a privilege uh, to be here and speaking uh, and, you know, uh, I was hearing to the thoughts of my other fellow panelists. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, Annie, uh, you know, and others from Coca-Cola. So, uh, you know, like generally UK has a law of disclosing the gender pay, but we took it to uh, other markets like US, China, India, and Mexico, where 50% of the, you know, uh, global population of RB is. And we, we try to do the analysis, like, you know, what, what we should do so that we need to have more inclusive uh, policies. We need to have more women participation, women in the leadership roles. So uh, we, we got certain insights, which were very interesting. This first gender uh, payroll report came out uh, in 2019. Uh, based on that, various initiatives were actually taken. Like, you know, the one, one of the initiatives is basically new parental leave policy. So from 16 weeks, we, we increase it to 26 weeks parental uh, leave policy. Uh, then uh, there's a concept of the reverse mentoring. Then we started the programs like Freedom to Succeed, DARE programs, then UK Living Wage, which is to support SDG 5, which is on the gender equality. And uh, all these things are leading us to like, you know, in 2022, uh, what we are seeing is like around 50% of the leadership positions in the company are filled by the women. And we are one of the big supporters of uh, diversity and, and inclusion. Uh, we recently supported uh, in India itself the first diversity and inclusion awards with the, one of the biggest industry chambers called SHM, uh, where we awarded uh, you know companies in India who were uh, who are doing who are going beyond in the law uh, because uh, to do things till uh, you know what law prescribes or subscribes like you know that's okay but you know uh, thinking beyond that is very important. And um, it's very interesting to know, like, you know, how whole landscape is changing, not inside just in our company, but outside. Uh, when, uh, like, we just talked about, uh, you know, role of men and women, uh, you know, in, uh, on the International Women's Day. But I must say, like, it's not just to, uh, between men and women, it's beyond that. So there is a, there's a big gamut of LGBTQ plus uh, I populations also, which play a very, very, very significant role. Uh, there are trans men, there are trans women. Uh, they also need a place. They need a support mechanism. A lot of work is to be done on those perspectives and uh, in those parameters. So we are very much on that. And we are also looking into like, you know, how we can make our programs more robust with the leadership uh, in the leadership in uh, Rekhid Bin Kizer, like our uh, new uh, uh, company CEO, Lakshman, and uh, then Ranjai, who's our global uh, uh, CHRO. So a lot of changes are, are coming in the company, like you know uh, the culture change. Where when we when I talk about the culture change, a lot of a lot of focus is actually there on diversity, on equity, on inclusion, uh, and uh, when we try to uh, you know uh, when we try to also do our social programs, which are outside the company, a lot of investments are done where women are involved. For example, when Prime Minister Modi announced the Clean India Initiative, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan in India. So, uh, you know, the one of the big intent was because, you know, India has a huge population. Women have to go in the open to defecate. We thought like we will be investing in those programs where which are gender responsive in nature, where women can actually get benefited uh, because, you know, toilet is everyone's right. So we thought like, you know, if we are putting our money behind the sustainability on, uh, on the uh, you know, company social responsibility, we will be working on these things. Second is like, you know, then uh, issues like malnutrition, issues like maternal mortality. So inside the companies, uh, uh, company, there are plenty of efforts which are being put. 
along with that through our uh, philanthropic money or for our purpose led interventions too we are putting uh, our investments behind where a uh, huge uh, investments are going on you know uh, uh, you know bringing a new career of women strengthening women at at, at the fee, as a, at the field force and documenting uh, some of these as the, as a business cases um like you know we have a program called reach each child and you know we we support around 40 plus organizations in the development space so uh, what typically is happening uh, is basically like you know uh, a lot a lot of a lot of focus has changed from just doing a program which was uh, which was short term to uh, an approach which is now very longitudinal in nature where we want to be uh, seen as a company which marries the brand purpose with the company purpose as well as the national purpose and when these three purposes are together and countries have uh, you know sdg goals on the gender equality so uh, we want to be seen as one of the largest contributors or a significant contributor and we are striving to achieve that thank you thank you so much ravi for sharing that with us on how what you're doing to address the issue of a uh, gender pay gap um of course um you know it's important for the company to be seen as doing something because this is not only about um gender equality but it's also about business right as you say just now so just to look at the further workplace initiative we know creating a safe and, and inclusive environment for both women and men are equally important so i like to turn now to miss trim my phone um miss fong is the vice president of human resources at unilever vietnam um unilever vietnam has launched a series of programs and policies to ensure a safe and inclusive workplace for all employees Um Ms. Fong, can you tell us a bit about this policies and what results have you seen from taking these measures? Over to you. Uh hi everyone. So uh it's my great pleasure to be on the panel today and it is a big day in Vietnam we're celebrating. So before I start, I'd like to show you some of the things that we are doing in uh you know Vietnam celebrating and giving every woman in the company give sad and flowers to celebrate this big day. Okay, that's a small thing, uh, but it means a lot. Okay, so uh, as you know, in Vietnam, it's a in a women business. We are selling product like for personal care and home care. So that's why the business case is so strong that we have to recruit women into our workplace and ensure they have their voices. You know, a safe and inclusive environment. So, uh, like with Coca Cola, currently uh, the ratio between female and male. In you know Vietnam is 50-50 for the management up at the director level it's also 50-50 at the board is about 33% and our CEO is a female leader great isn't it and and I I totally agree with 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 uh, Joanna for Coca-Cola we have to reduce the social bias uh, versus uh, against females in the workplace and you know what um Even though Vietnam is a quite a progressive country uh, for female development, but um, if I go out from here and there, I keep hearing comments like, "Why you guys, you know, female? Why why females have to work so hard? Businesses and tech roles are for male, not for you. Please choose something easy, like to be a teacher, to be nurses, but not to be business leader or tech leader." So what we did is that we go to universities, to business schools, to tech schools, to talk to 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 all the students, especially for talk talking to female students, to raise aware, awareness, and to talk about their right to do whatever they dream. So we bring female leaders to campuses, and they are kind of inspiration model for the female students, you know, to follow their dreams and to join us. So this is something that we can. help you know raise awareness and introduce the social bias versus uh, against the female students yeah and once they join of course we have to identify the key pain points that could you know um prevent them from having a progressive career with us uh, so practices like with coca cola how to ensure a equal opportunity for uh, promotions you know you know for the job opportunity for international assignments Uh, 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 um posted and females are always prioritized for those roles yeah and another practice is is that how to ensure the 
uh, safe and in, in inclusiveness, we provide a lot of training on DNI, diversity, inclusiveness. And I believe in the power of training, you know. You talk about the values of the company and then the importance of doing so and practices and policies, how to ensure that one, yeah? So, um, so and, and recently um, with the COVID-19, we understand the burdens that women have to go through. You know, you have to take care of your child, you have to take care of family, you have to take care of jobs. So how, how can we help women with that one? So one of that is the agile uh, working policy we introduced even before COVID, you know, because we saw the trend. So we allow people, you know, you have a need to, to stay at home, uh, taking care of your family while working, as long as you deliver the output, it's okay. So people can feel free to work from home. And even now with the Eastman situation in Vietnam, we allow people, uh, especially women, you know, uh, you know, stay at home and, 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 and apply a child ways of working. So I think uh, that's very well received by our employees because, you know, uh, they can feel like they manage the, the work and life much, much better. Yeah. And for the uh, safety, you know, I understand that some people asking us about question about how can you show the uh, safe environment? Yes. Uh, respect and the safety is it's it's one of the highest values so we produce um we we develop policy for uh to be to be against all sorts of uh, bullying abuse or harassment at work we set up hotline so if anyone has any concern about their own safety uh not just now uh, sexual harassment any kind of concern about the line manager unsafe environment they can call in into the hotline um, and, you know, and raise the concern and the concerns are addressed by the local and, and, and global business integrity committee. So we take things very, very seriously. And other small kind of things that can help women to place um, is uh, providing extra support. For example, we organize a well-being program, um, training a young woman how to take care of the young families of the newly born, for example, uh, organizing uh, uh, young mo um, among a club, for example, and uh, you know, a small thing like childcare during you know peak time, but they, for example, so that uh, you know um, uh, the children are well taken care of. So those are the um, examples how we do things at Unilever. I hope it uh, it is uh, this information is use useful for the panel. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Fong. Um, I, I really liked um, the point you made about, um, you know, how you are bringing the female leaders from Unilever to school students to show that, you know, they are these role models. Um, because in my own career, um, I have definitely benefited from seeing the role models in my career, um, you know, with female editor-in-chief and female bureau chief that I have worked with. Um, to show that, you know, women can really do it if they want to. Um, so we might come back to you with more questions on that, um, because I was also seeing a few questions in the chat rooms talking about the sort of culture barriers and what we are doing uh, in, to address that. So we might have more questions on that. And uh, for the audience uh, who are listening in or, um, you know, if you have more questions, please feel free to put that in the chat room. And finally, um, one of the areas we see impacting women at all levels in the workforce is the unequal burden of care work. And this is, of course, getting more acute um, given our work now has moved into our home, our kitchen, our living hall, and then school, you know, still closed in, in many places. Um, so we are very pleased to have with us today Ms. Carolina from IKEA China who is going to share the approach of what they are doing at IKEA China to, you know, what they are doing to address the unpaid care work across their value chain. So Ms. Carolina Horstad is the Vice President of Corporate Communications and Public Affairs at IKEA China. Um, Carolina, can you tell us how can these measures that you have taken at IKEA China support women to achieve uh, more leadership positions? Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Billy, and uh, hello, everybody. And thank you for this uh, invitation for this great panel and uh, opportunity for us uh, to share how do we see gender equality from the light at home perspective. Uh, so, you know, IKEA has been always focused on uh, creating a better everyday life uh, for the many people and home. And we strongly believe that home is the most important place uh, in the world 
And uh, actually the last pandemic out uh, outbreak uh, is make the home even more important. And it is, uh, it couldn't be more truer uh, than ever. Uh, we also think that uh, every day uh, should be an equal every day. And uh, the gender equality should really start at home because this is the foundation for the uh, gender equality in the society. Why at home? Because every day and everything starts at home. As you said also, uh, Billy, that the, the, uh, the recent outbreak uh, also put into the light uh, more the situation of uh, unfair sharing, unbalanced sharing of the uh, home duties, uh, home uh, unfair care uh, in the recent uh, uh, time. And this is where IKEA would really like to help. We have seen the report that was uh, released by China National Bureau of Statistics already in 2019, uh, showing cre clearly that uh, women uh, say that usually they do, uh, take two and half times more of the unpaid care work uh, in compared to the, uh, uh, to the men. And the impact of the uh, pandemic situation has amplified uh, the gender inequalities. So we strongly believe empowering women and home has been never uh, uh, more important than today. We also have the research showing that a third of uh, women on uh, uh, the markets where IKEA is present, they feel that their careers is held back because they do more at home than men. It is also uh, leading to the situation uh, that women have like weaker uh, economic position and the potential is underestimated. So we decided to drive this kind of awareness and to start more open discussion about uh, this topic uh, and more open conversations about uh, equal sharing of domestic uh, roles and responsibilities. That is why uh, we are launching actually today externally and uh, uh, launch recently internally a campaign equality at home. And this is a little bit uh, campaign that is uh, with a twinkle in the eye. We are engaging, uh, like inviting our coworkers, consumers, customers, and the whole share partners uh, to play a game, a digital game, which is called 50-50, and uh, uh, invite people to answer some different uh, questions. Uh, there are no winners, there are bo uh, the two people are winners. So we really uh, hope that it's going to bring to the positive uh, discussions in a positive way. And um, that will also uh, have more discussions uh, in the general society. Unfortunately, we also see uh, the connection between unfair care, uh, care work and the violence against the women, because sometimes not fulfilling the expected uh, care roles is the excuse for the violence, for the gender-based violence. And that is why we are very happy uh, that we started cooperations with uh, UN Women in China, and we have initiated a project named A Place Called Home, We Care. This is a project uh, that is uh, established uh, as for now for, for two years, and we want to really um, start the conversation. We want to look uh, for the situation that uh, people in the recovery after the pandemic we we'll really get the support for the from the communities uh, to address the topic uh, of, uh, of gender-based uh, uh, violence. We are also going to reach the millions of people uh, in China, uh, especially people living uh, with the families, to, uh, to, to have more happy life, uh, also to uh, encourage people to look into how to care for women's well-being and their development. Uh, we also do strongly believe that uh, we have uh, a role to play as the employer. Uh, so we have plugged uh, the gender gap in all parts uh, of our business. Globally, by 2022, IKEA wants to have uh, really um, a strong uh, gender balance, 50-50%. In all, all levels of the organizations, in all units, and uh, in all functions. I'm also very happy to say that by the end of the fiscal year of uh, 2020, 
Uh, IKEA in China, we have very strong balance, uh, having 50-50% on the manager level positions and 50-50% uh, among the co-workers. From my personal story, I also want to share that I am a mother of uh, three children, and I'm also very happy uh, uh, to contribute with my competences, with my leadership staff to development of uh, IKEA uh, on the, uh, the manager positions. And this is uh, um, thanks also to the uh, two factors that I have, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to have in my life. First is IKEA really supporting me, being patient when I uh, waiting for me uh, to uh, when I was on the maternity leave, and most of all also for my husband who is uh, really having a, a, a fantastic um, contribution uh, to to our sharing responsibilities at home. So I strongly believe, and we at IKEA, we strongly believe uh, that uh, an equal world is a better world, and we all have a, a role to play in it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carolina. And you know, you are absolutely right. Equal world is better work, and and you know, each of you, all the speakers, has provided us with all the insights that you know on the initiative and the programs you have done on promoting women leadership in your own companies, but also really it's about giving and, you know, setting the example for the broader industry on what they could do and getting some inspirations from here. Um, I'm really inspired. And you have touched on the, you know, really different areas from gender pay gap to inclusive workplace to how to build a pipeline. And, you know, from, from Anne in Malaysia, how you work with you know, the industry and the broader sort of business sector on how, how we achieve that. So thank you so much for all that insight. And I can see uh, questions are already uh, going in the chat room. And um, maybe I can start with the first sort of three questions. Um, and actually two of them are related. Um, and the questions, the first one, um, you know, is from Siri Pond. Um, basically asking on whether you face any sort of resistance, you know, in the company on accepting that, whether there are any sort of unconscious gender bias. And the second questions and the third are related. Second is from Maria. And um, she's saying that I see that women second guess themselves and they may have the same ideas, but hesitate to speak up and the men beat them to it. I think this is something that Jonah has touched on a little bit just now in her own presentations. Um, so the uh, the third one um, is on also on the issues about culture barriers on how your company encourage women to apply for jobs within your company. And once they are in, how do your companies encourage women career development? So um, yeah, it's, so the, the questions are about unconscious gender bias, the reasons resistant to that, and how what your company is doing to tackle that sort of culture barriers. Um, could I maybe go to um, Rawi first? Would you like to share some of your insights on that, and maybe to Fung us after that? Yeah, sure. It's a it's indeed very uh, interesting and very you know burning question, and uh, yeah, definitely like you know. Um, a lot of efforts have to be done to reduce, uh, you know, the gender bias, and unconsciously also, like you know, uh, people, people, people do bias, and uh, uh, it's it's a whole behavioral change and a, you know habit process how the habits are formed in the leadership, and uh, many times, like you know, uh, someone has rightly said, like you know, there needs to be a discussion where it it is not just a gender issue; it it, it becomes a business issue. So when it's a business issue, it's uh, seen more seriously and uh, there are more chances like, you know, uh, things can be uh, improvised on and a very clear reflection. The resilience is required in absence of resilience. Uh, sometimes, you know, the agendas just become the vision statements and, you know, they don't move uh, at all. And resilience is required, uh, you know, at all levels from the management level to the, uh, you know, the, you know, in, in the small and medium scale industries, it may be at the promoter level, but definitely resilience is the key. Uh, and, you know, uh, there are actions uh, which needs to be there, which will, uh, which will lead to, uh, you know, uh, fast, fast tracking the process. Sometimes people do ask, like, you know, uh, are you, uh, you know, like, uh, 
uh, are we mavericks? But it's very important to be maverick at some point of time if you want some quick changes. Uh, maybe speed over perfection, but definitely change has to be thought, well thought of. And, uh, you know, like things can be improvised in future. That's, that's my take on this particular situation. like to share your perspective on this issue? Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah. I, I, I couldn't hear you. So to continue the topic on how to overcome the control biases, right? So based on my experience, the leaders play a big role, really. So when I brought you know, our female CEO to talk to the group of female students, things changed drastically. When I brought to the audience an R&D you know, female leader as well, they would say, wow, female can do men's job, you know, to be a CEO or r &D. So those are very you know, proven kind of evidence to convince them. So that's externally. Internally, um, I think uh, we need to do a business case. Always measure the success, you know? So I give you one example. I have two factories. One is quite old, run mostly by men. And we set up a new factory. And we say, we take this opportunity to introduce more female into the workplace. And we measure the productivity after we introduce that one. And the result was kind of amazing. So that was a very, great you know business case to show the productivity when you have more females into the workplace and especially in the supply chain environment yeah thank thank you so much for that um i don't know any other speakers would like to add in if you like just please feel free to jump Me, in just on my point on i think the self-doubt is an important topic to tackle uh, women oftentimes second guess themselves, and I myself had had experience on that. And, and that's why I raised the point on mentorship and sponsorship, because we kind of need a nudge whenever we're poised for the next step. In fact, the last two promotions I had, I wasn't so sure if I can do it. But the mentors I had around me and the sponsors helped me figure out and convince myself that I'm ready for it. Uh, we often have like this checklist of like, there's a st study that they say, of, of 10 things, women would say, oh, I, I, own, I can't apply because I have one thing missing. But when men see that list, they see every opportunity. So that kind of perspective is important. Um, I've talked about removing the biases and removing the barriers, but what's overarching on all of these is removing the self-doubt. Uh, oftentimes, it's not competence that's a, that's a problem with women. It's really confidence. And we've seen that time and again uh, of questioning themselves every single time. Um, that's how we built it in co Mentorship and sponsorship are critical. I can just add here, Lee, to the, the conversation. So I think sometimes when we use the word bias, you know, people think it's bad. You know, it's negative, right? So I think it's actually accepting the fact that a lot of this unconscious bias doesn't come from a malicious, uh, you know, a point. It's actually coming from a very good intended point, you know, and it's about stereotypes. So you, they always decided now, I think it's best that the woman doesn't take this role because it will demand a lot of time. It's a 24 by seven. It's in a dangerous location or it, it involves, you know, so it's coming from a good point of view. So, uh, uh, and these biases are built over many years. It's coming from culture, work experience, the way you're brought up, your values that you're taught. So in our experience, when we've worked with organizations, we felt that, you know, sometimes it needs to be raised. The self-awareness of these biases needs to be raised. So a lot of the time, it's about that work that creates a huge impact once they realize where this bias is coming. And then the question is, do we really need to think that way? And I give you one example. So we worked in a, in a, in a space where it is an, an oil and gas uh, space. And um, the bias is maybe we shouldn't send women out in that location because it is a security issue. But it's a security issue even for men, really, right? It's also safety. So it's really not gender-based. It's, 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 it's a safety issue. But they were thinking of it from a perspective that it's not safe for women because it's a location that, you know, may cause uh, uh, 
other safety issues. So when we started questioning the line of thinking, it came from a point where I'm thinking for the good of the women, but the women are saying, no, I want that opportunity because when I have that opportunity, it speaks very well on my CV and it gives me an opportunity to go for the next promotion. So I don't mind taking that risk. So why don't you ask me, right? Instead of take- So I think it's really about realization and then those biases can be addressed and it goes away and we can really take away those uh, stereotypes off the table. But getting to that point is where we need to encourage organizations to have open conversations because bias is not bad. It is the reality, right? Uh, and that's our experience when it comes to shifting mindsets and talking about biases Thank and stereotypes. That's a great Thank point. You so, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you Thank so you much. On that, yeah. I can add on that uh, I think it is very important that uh, no woman feels uh, uh, that she got uh, like promoted or uh, got the, her leadership uh, role only because she's the woman. Yeah. Uh, we are uh, women with uh, fantastic competences. We are women uh, that are bringing a lot of uh, new perspective uh, to the leadership uh, positions. And this is uh, a foundation of our development. Of course, with this, uh, like, uh, confidence uh, challenges, we need support not only from other women, but we really need support also from the men, from the entire society. But the most important is that it is really connected uh, with what is our real contribution here. If there is the focus, uh, we can find a lot of, uh, um, of ladies who will break down this confidence issues and we're really be helping to this uh, developing of the many small or big businesses around the world. Thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, yeah, just, just to add on from the sort of bias, um, I can definitely relate to this as well, you, because even in journalism, you know, we have seen sometimes, you know, women journalists would not be sent to so-called the kind of tough excitement, like war zones, conflict zones, or covering street protests just because they are women, right? So um, they are often assigned to cover some soft news kind of feature story because they are not designed to cover political hard news. But yeah, the, just that sort of biases are very, very embedded um, in our society today, still very embedded. Um, and I'm glad to hear all of you are in your own way doing something to tackle this issue. So we have still about um, 10 minutes to go um, to our end of our Q&A sessions. And I see a lot of questions uh, going in the chat room. So I'm going to pick like maybe two. Um, so this one is how do we go about shifting the conversation from a gender issue to a business issue? Um, maybe Anne could say something about that later, uh, very, very quick. And, and the last question, there was a questions about, um, you know, many, uh, in some countries, many small businesses are started by women, but the name are registered in their husband name. And, you know, that comes to the issue about uh, uh, reporting, uh, transparency in reporting, um, which I know is very much at the heart of uh, what the uh, UN Women and We Empower Asia is doing, is about promoting that sort of better uh, gender reporting data, you know, getting companies to declare what they are doing so we can know what other progress have been made and, you know, which area, what are the gaps that we need to fill. So maybe um, if I could ask, um, um, you, you know, um, some of our speakers here to um, quickly share, you know, how can we sh shift the conversation from a gender issue to business issue? And also what can companies really do to sort of promote that sort of transparency and better gender reporting? So maybe Anne would like to quickly start on the um, questions on shifting the conversations. Yeah, so I go back to my example of how we moved it, right? So we had to be relevant to the business. We had to bring the topic to become a business relevant issue. So if I look at this, I think one way is really to set up or to sit together with the leader because it has to be leadership involved in this whole this, uh, DEI strategy. It's not something driven out of HR, is not something driven out of any other. It's got to be from the leadership. So the most important is to build a business case. So what exactly does this business feel they're going to achieve by putting in place this DEI? What are the business values? And until you are able to quantify those business values, it is very hard to shift and shape mindsets, to look at it as a serious business imperative. 
So the hard indicators will be, will it really matter to my top line, my bottom line, my client base? Will it really make a difference in terms of bringing in better talent? So these are all hard, uh, quantifiable facts that will then make the leadership sit back and say, okay, if it's really going to drive my business, I'm really going to be able to go out to client consumer bases that I never could reach. If it's really going to give me the best talent in my organization, I'm willing to sit back and let's look at it. So building the business case as the start with very clear indicators that you want to achieve and getting that buy-in at leadership is the first step, I think, that will take this conversation down the organization. Without that, you're just going to tick boxes for compliance. And without that, it's not going to be sustainable in the organization. That's what I feel. And I think uh, it has to be a systematically driven strategy, business strategy. It cannot be, I do a bit of this, I do a bit of that. And that's why I like the way WEPS activates the program because it is so well thought through. It comes in, it helps you understand the business case, and then it takes you to trying to identify your gaps and then it takes you to trying to implement and recommends to you good implementable uh, change. So it has to be a very systematically driven approach. So for organizations who don't know how to do it, this is a great way to come in. And you can come in at any point of your journey. You know? And of course, starting off with get the leadership buy-in. Without it, you will never be able to succeed to get to uh, the end goal. Could we, thanks, and um, could we perhaps get um, the other speaker to respond to the issue of uh, gender, gender reporting? Maybe I can try to be also to, yeah, I, I will, uh, will be also happy to, uh, to build on the uh, um, uh, uh, answer for this question because we have also some uh, um, experience at uh, IKEA. So we really see that uh, the gender equality needs uh, a, a focus. Yeah, because uh, uh, and the focus might last until this is really uh, somehow absorbed or implemented in the business uh, and the in the societies. We also have the experience when when we lost the focus, uh, we also lost uh, uh, lost the balance, and uh, we stopped talking uh, in, uh, about it, and we stopped seeing the difference in the organization. And uh, uh, we also noticed that uh, for the gender equality, you can uh, put the goals exactly like you put to the uh, business, yeah, like you put the business goals, yeah, and to follow up uh, with this uh, to see what are the movements uh, and uh, and to uh, to really move uh, uh, from this perspective. Uh, also, we, to be uh, a successful organization. We have implemented at IKEA a global strategy, but of course, it must be the um, uh, the, the activation of the local st uh, of the global strategy must be really focused on based on the uh, market situations, on different countries' situations, to meet uh, to move the activities that are uh, relevant uh, for maybe making the real change uh, on uh, in different countries. So this is how we look into this. So putting the goals is the foundation, have the focus, is the foundation, uh, and then really everybody will see the benefits. Okay, thank you so much, Karina. Um, anyone else would like to add on to that? If not, I'm gonna, because of the, our time constraints, I know there are still a lot of questions uh, in the Q&A chat room, um, but I would like to ask the last question here. Um, I like to always end my interview or discussion with something positive, you know, something that could give us some sort of inspirations to take home, you know, on what we can do. So if I could ask each of the speakers um, to quickly tell us, you know, what is the one actions that you want to see companies in the region taking to ensure we get more women into leadership positions? I'll give you one minute to respond to that. And if you could, yeah, just tell us so, you know, we can, all of us here, the participants today can be inspired. And, you know, after this call, we can go back and do something together. So maybe Ravi, would you like to start? Yeah, thank you so much. So one thing uh, which I think is like, you know, uh, there, may be, uh, there may be more, uh, you know, reservation for the women uh, at the workplaces uh, in terms of like, you know, especially the board level positions, because, uh, board positions are very, very, very important and there needs to be more representation. 
if you are not able to break that ceiling the situation will be same so uh, breaking the ceilings is something which uh, personally i will be also driving this agenda and i always do it and uh, i uh, the board positions should have more women representation that's that's what i want to say thank you miss joanna and maybe after that carolina and miss fong and then and joanna my advice to the companies is don't just set a goal act on it I think it's important. We, we've talked about 50-50 gender parity, but more often than not, people set a goal, but don't put a plan to it. And you realize that there's no one-size-fits-all in terms of solution. You have to really build a gender inclusivity roadmap, inciting and understand what's important for your associates. So the UN UNWEFs is a good starting point on that. The seven principles are simple, clear, hits through every part of the business. So I encourage you to... To sign the website, I think maybe that's a good start, and then begin to have that conversation internally in your co companies. Hey, I can continue. Uh, so uh, I strongly believe that the beginning of uh, every change, uh, change uh, is the open conversation. That is why in 2021 we would like to call for open conversation about the recognition, reduction, and redistribution of unpaid uh, care work. And also, uh, we strongly believe that we'll create for more inclusive and balanced everyday life, not only at home, but in the total uh, society for the many people. Thank you. Fong? Yes, Fong? Yes, and uh, just to, I think, uh, to recall with other uh, panelists, I think leadership is important. So have a strong stance for DNI gender equality and progressively drive the agenda, walk the talk and lead by example. And don't forget, you have to institutionalize through the HR practices, policies. So that's my key message. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. And finally, Anne? So I guess in my case, it's a, it's a wrap up of everybody really. So I basically say, you know, it's got to start from the top. And what you want to get done needs to be measured. So ensure that the strategy is holistic. Because if you do it in points, bits and pieces, you never see the end product. And it's a waste of everybody's effort and time. So measure it, make sure there's a clear strategy, and get the buy-in right from the top. And that's critical for organizations. Thank you so much, Anne, and thank you so much to all the speakers. Um, I can see there are still so many questions in the chat room that my apologies that we don't have a chance, I haven't had a chance to ask them, but you know, I'm sure this conversation will continue offline. And you know, it, all the speakers have given us so much to think about today, the inspirations, um, you know, to, to take home and you know, we really can do something together on this. So with that, um, that's a wrap from us. And um, I'd like to hand over to uh, Katia again, thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much, um, Yi, for taking us through this panel. And thank you so much, um, panelists, for sharing your very honest um, perspectives. I just want to say one wrapping up um, element from my side or a reflection. I think listening to all of you and then kind of bringing it back to the topic of today, when women lead, I think we have heard a lot about that it's not only about appointing women into leadership position, right? It's really creating the environment around it. What does it take to get women into this leadership position? It's not just an appointment. It is so much more. And you have really kind of looked uh, at the different dimensions from care work, from um, gender bias, from equal pay. I loved on your last point on um, measurement and really make visible only when it's visible and measured, we can transform, right? Other, nothing what's not measured is not going to be transformed. And and Shona, your um, last call to action, getting companies to sign the webs really is sort of a first step for, for taking leadership and really thinking through this in a holistic way across the value chain. And I think that's also our um, last word from you and women to this uh, is really we wanted to use this opportunity today, particularly to have a conversation with business leaders and really aspire more to um, to join our webs community. If you see in the chat, there's another, uh, there's a couple of other events that are upcoming the next two days where we also have interesting um, conversations um, on the webs, but also on the wider topic of um, gender equality in business. 
but I would love to kind of really invite you, um, if you can just maybe quickly on the screen share, um, also the companies um, that really would like to join us moving um, forward. We will um, be sharing some very concrete steps on um, how to do this. Um, so how to become a signatory of the women's empowerment principles, really have a look here at um, um, the webs.org um, website. Everything is very clearly um, there. But please um, don't hesitate also to reach um, out to us. Um, we're going to share um, our contact details as well in the recording of the session and also the follow up. But before I close the session, um, this was International Women's Day, um, but We Empower Asia is really using um, the momentum around gender equality, and we don't want to stop the conversation uh, another year. So we're really um, very delighted to just share um, a couple of um, upcoming um, events with you, but one of the bigger ones, I would love to invite actually our newly appointed um, Goodwill Ambassador of UN Women, Ms. Cindy Bishop, who's unfortunately not here today, but sharing um, an invitation to all of you for something um, bigger upcoming um, this year. With this, I would just ask um, Amy quickly to turn on the video and we'll be back in one minute um, with the final wrap up. Let's hope that this works. On Hello technology. and happy International Women's Day to all of you joining us today. As we celebrate the theme, Women in Leadership, Achieving an Equal Future in a COVID-19 World, we must recognize that commitment and a variety of actions are required to create an enabling environment in which women are allowed to enter the workforce, stay in the workforce, and advance to leadership positions. Now more than ever, it is important to stand up for gender equality. We can't just imagine it, we have to create it by what we say, what we do, how we measure, and how we lead. All around the world and in Asia Pacific, we see business leaders stepping up to take action for gender equality and the achievement of the SDGs. But we need more leaders to step up. Last year, I was honored to celebrate the region's top business champions for gender equality at the first annual UN Women Asia Pacific's WEPS Awards. The WEPS Awards is the first ever regional awards recognizing exemplary business practices in achieving gender equality aligned with the Women Empowerment Principles, or the WEPS. I am proud to join forces with UN Women We Empower Asia program once again, and I invite all of you to join us on April 21st as we celebrate the launch event for the 2021 UN Women Asia Pacific WEPS Awards, where we will unveil the 2021 award categories as well as celebrate all the new WEPS signatories in the region. Visit webs.org today to make a commitment and also join us on the 21st as we celebrate action on the women's empowerment principles and send a strong message that we are generation equality. Great, uh, huge thank you um, to Cindy for supporting us um, in this effort, but a uh, huge thank you for, for all of you who had um, participated um, last year. And what we want to do is really make this a movement and really get more companies, as many of you said, to really join us and really share their best practices to mobilize others. So we're gonna have um, this year, as we said before, we're gonna be starting the web awards much earlier. So to give you also more time um, to really um, apply with very strong applications. So we will have our launch event on the 21st of April. Um, as Cindy said, we're gonna be really um, sharing the categories that we, be, we will be awarding companies for. Um, so that will be a, a great event for you to join and for your teams to join as well. But we will also use um, the momentum on April 21st to celebrate new signatories um, of the women's empowerment principles in the region. So please um, share this with your communities. Many of you are already um, web signatories, but um, new companies, hopefully, that um, have joined us today, please really join us and sign the women's empowerment principles and use that momentum on the 21st of April to be recognized. So we're going to be recognizing all new signatories there. So there is more than six weeks to go. So that's a, a, good, and a, a good period to really mobilize your leadership to um, get commitments going. And we really hope that we will see all of you back on the 21st of April for this um, launch event. And then 
obviously moving forward to also participating in the um, BEPS Awards uh, second edition um, this year. With this last word, on the minutes, um, timing excellent. Um, so a huge, huge thank you and a very, very happy um, Women's Day for everyone, also for the men here celebrating with us. And I opened, opened with sort of a clap on your shoulder and please continue that passion. And it takes our leadership to really move the needle. But I'm so, so proud to see this community, that business community in Asia Pacific to get together um, with the wider society to really shift the needle. So thank you very much uh, once again. And we will be sharing the recording and a follow up to all of the attendees of this session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.